Hi everyone, I'm Dan Abers, and welcome to This Week in Anderson on the Big Guy Sports Podcast. And as always, I am joined with my co-host Steve Ellis. And Steve, I'm really excited about our next guest. Uh, I knew him growing up, great athlete at uh, McNicholas High School. Yep. Also very successful in the business world. And uh, it's always cool for us to to talk with people that you know we knew you know in the Anderson area growing up, but went yep. to either McNick or Turpin. So I'm really excited to have Jimmy Serger here. Well, I've always known the name, and, and it's an honor just to to meet and talk to him here. But I'll tell you this, once we get going into this, yeah. the people here, the life he has lived to this date, you know, people are going to think they've lived a boring life. <laughs> There's no <laughs> doubt about it. We'll, we'll, we'll kind of talk about that. But like we said, joining us is uh, uh, Jimmy Serger. And Jimmy, I really appreciate you joining us here tonight. Well, Steve and Danny, I appreciate you having me on. What a great show. I've watched it numerous times over the years, and you've had some great guests. You really have, talking about both sides of Clough, you yeah, know, and then right. us right there in the middle of Nick Nick. <laughs> so I, I really appreciate you guys having me on today. So let's go back. I obviously we've known you for a long time and knowing your father too and, and your family because growing up on the on the good side of summit on some of the states there over Relax. uh great yeah it's a great great side there so <laughs> talk a little bit about uh, the, the days growing up and what it was like and, and and obviously we already know what side you lived on sure we lived going back there by the woods of uh, muskegon the very yeah. last street yeah. to be built uh our house driveway was so steep that the previous owner from one year before they moved actually got free electric work done because it was such a grade <laughs> that really? mr Farmire, I believe, was his name. Really? Uh, free electric work done because yeah. the zoning changed mid build, and it was pretty funny. So my parents jumped on that in '77. So they were the second owner up there on Muskegon. What a terrific place! I mean, you're talking a thousand homes, and I think by the time I was in eighth grade, there was 900 backboards to play basketball right. on throughout the <laughs> community. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We had a swimming pool. We had the woods around back. You had a convenience store, a little pizza place, a butcher shop. I mean, if you had a bike, you knew where everybody was. Yep. All your friends were in the neighborhood, and yep. I grew up with them since first grade at IHM, and then all, half my neighborhood went to Anderson, the other yeah. half went to IHM, and then boom, you know, you still reminisce about the time, but every time you run into somebody, it's always some at this and some at that, the Albers family, the right. McManus yeah. family, I mean, the, the whole bar, names yeah. just go back, and it's just an <laughs> excellent community. I mean, when it was first built, it was the largest subdivision in the state of Ohio. I mean, can you imagine somebody's vision back in the late 60s, no, early no. 70s? Man. I'm going to build a thousand home yeah. neighborhood. Yeah. Well, well, two things, and we had kind of briefly talked about this before, was uh, I had read somewhere at the uh, Anderson Township, Township History, Historical, Historical Society, Society, I can say it, that there was a, uh, a train that actually went through Summit right through Muskegon really? heading out towards Bethel and, wow. and you're like man how is that even possible it, just to envision that well and the, the crazy thing too Jimmy I don't know if you remember you and I obviously always went back in those woods back there behind McManus's house and everything and if you went far deep down in there I remember there was not a pond but there was like a there was something real. I just remember it like being really big back there I don't know if it was a pond or a cri there was just something that I remember we always went to try to explore sure, sure. You, I'm sure you always went back Everybody woods. went back yeah. there. Those Everybody woods were uh, it's like a movie. Took you to, took you to Kmart too. I mean, exactly. And <laughs> the Galpins you know midnight, yeah, exactly. moonlight special. Moonlight special. <laughs> so here, I wanted to ask you because I lived in summer for 14 years. Um, my yard backed up basically behind McGalpins. And I paid two property taxes. Half of my yard was Hamilton County. The other half was Claremont County. Was that, were you on that side too? Well, it's funny you should say that because our mailbox, Muskegon's in Hamilton County. As soon as you walked off the back porch, it was Claremont. Yeah. So during the day, yeah. when they first bought the house, all they paid was Hamilton until it was restructured. So okay. my parents lived there for nearly 30 years. Yeah. And I'm sure once a new owner took that over, the new zoning came through. Wow. Okay. I don't know that. But That's my crazy, dad always though. said, we got Claremont in the back and Hamilton in the front. Yeah. So not too shabby. Huh? Yeah, that's you get hurt, crawl to the front. Well, right. <laughs> you know, it's funny, and it's funny. I just remember John Raymond always saying that too, because he's the same way. He's yeah, on the other side, that's exactly uh, where right. you were. Yeah, exactly yeah. on the same street you were. So, yeah. I mean, that's just, uh, but crazy. But the, you know, and what the other thing too, Jimmy, real quick, as I remember, is like we were older guys, but I remember the younger kids like yourself and and the Horn, Craig Hornschmeyer, all those guys. We didn't care. You wanted to play ball. You guys were all. Everybody was down there playing ball, and, and all. 
all the family seem to know everybody. Well, it's funny you say that. We talk about Fourth of July picnics and mm-hmm. parades nowadays, yep. and yes, they still take place. But back there in Summit, it just oh. seemed like every kid owned a bike. Yep. Every parent was drinking beer, and everybody <laughs> decorated their bike. And we go shut down the streets down. exactly, yeah. shut the streets down, and everybody would thumb through in their parade on their bike, and then about yeah. an hour later, regroup, meet at the Alberts' neighborhood yep. right down there at the dead end circle, right there, oh, yeah. close it yeah. off. Everybody shoot fireworks. Somebody yes. blow, blow a finger off or yeah. something like yeah. that. And <laughs> throw, blow up a couple beer cans. You know, yeah. back then you could do that. I don't even right. know if you can get away with that anymore. Somebody know. will call in on you. Bottle, well, rocket, nobody, bottle rocket fights. I remember having bottle rocket fights all the time. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. That's great. So when you were growing up in Summit and then playing some on some sports teams, what sports did you play? I played baseball when we moved back. And actually, Mr. McManus, yes. who Danny knows and you know as yep. well, Oh, he yeah. was my first coach, so I was in kindergarten and I actually got to play a year up with Terry McManus and yep. TR. TR and all those Brian. guys. TR so Brian, yeah. I was actually able to play with them, so I played with them for two years. Okay. So then the Almers Oilers. Almers Oilers. How yep. did you come up with that? Because that's what they were. That's they right. were blue, baby blue uniforms. Yep. Pinstripes after the Yankees. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Did you see the stats in like the Mount Washington I, well, uh, press? Or? <laughs> so, so Mr. McManus. <laughs> you were the first World Journal? Well, you obviously know Mr. McManus and my dad were really close. Close. All the neighborhood guys were close, so I was close to the McManus family because of that, and we'd always be down there. So they'd have a game. Mr. McManus would just throw us in a car, and we'd go down to these games. So I was at a lot of their games all the times, and yeah. and I remember Mr. McManus calling it, you know, because of Almers, and, right? Yeah, you know, game, right? let's call us the Oilers, you know. Yeah, it's yeah like, Almers is still in business. They own one up there yeah. by Salem Gardens, right. and they own one else actually out there in Milford too. You so, guys had some really good teams. We had some great teams, and then uh, from there I moved on to Jennings Buick. And I had Mr. Schwartz and Linville were my coaches. Oh, yeah. And then my dad took over my brother's team for another Almer. So Mr. McManus had an Almer's. Okay. And then my dad had an Almer's yeah. team. And then I was right in that middle age that I played with, you know, everybody in the neighborhood. Right. I, everybody in Summit was on that team. Every kid. I think I was the only kid that went to IHM. Everybody else was going to Anderson. <laughs> <laughs> so know. was baseball your main sport? That was the main sport. I mean, I grew up on baseball. My dad played baseball. His whole family played baseball. Okay. My dad played for UC and was actually drafted by the Phillies out of high school. Nice. And uh, so baseball has been in my blood since I was a wee little guy running around the place. Okay. So I played baseball at uh, Little League, and, and then when I was old enough to play, uh, I was able to play soccer and basketball at IHM. But my dad would not let me play football at all. At okay. all, period. He believed that the bodies weren't developed enough and my head couldn't take the hit or my shoulder couldn't take the hit <laughs> yeah. or my wrist. He, he really felt that We're going to talk about that here in a few I know. He really felt that kids just weren't developed and let them run around, burn energy, ADHD, whatever I had or some other kids yeah. had. He believed, run them to death. Sure. Let them burn that extra energy off. So yeah. it wasn't until eighth grade that I was able to play football. I cannot see you play soccer. I just, I can't. I'm sorry. I just, I, I just remember how you were. I love soccer I could just I sit know, back as fullback I didn't have to run you just the ball comes to you you kick it right <laughs> how hard is that right it's, real. it's you know, that easy yeah. it's that easy that's, that's why I never played after 8th grade again <laughs> so I, we're going to get into the football and Danny's going to talk about this helmet here oh. your story about that but let's talk about baseball first because uh, I, I believe you played for coach Ray Ayers is that right I did so I played for a lot of great coaches a lot of names and leaders that you guys have probably heard about throughout the community you know Ray Ayers was my high school coach mm-hmm. uh, then you go back and that was Gary Pearson taught at IHM and mm-hmm. we won the city championship or runner up I should say my 8th grade year okay. he was a terrific coach Skip Berger what a Skip great Berger. what a oh, great yeah. mentor there's a name yeah. Yeah. Scott yeah. Berger and Chris sure. Berger's yeah. dad yeah. what a great leader he was you yeah. know, he was a Good Cincinnati people. police officer yep. he donated his time yep. and you had Mr. McManus Todd Zimmerman sure. uh, his dad Terry Zimmerman was one of my coaches I mean you think about it life as a block uh, each one of us as we get older has a block in us and we give that on to the next generation kind of wisdom mentorship leadership whatever our values are and I thank all those gentlemen and some of them I still talk to today I mean Eric Williams is dad uh, yeah. Pat Williams he was yep. he was there Mr. McKee Mr. Ludwig yes. Mr. Wow. McKee he was also an umpire too. yes very yeah. good yeah yeah yeah, yeah good so, guy Howie Ludwig uh, yeah. Karen Ludwig's dad sure. I mean all those people that we grew up with in Summit were my first leaders or mentors on how to live and how to run their life and some of them taught me how to keep score right. you know, some of them really chewed my butt out when I wasn't hustling you know, I, Mr. Schwartz sent me around the school quite a 
few times for not listening to him. Yeah. But, you know, then you get a little bit older, and then the Ray Ayers come in. And, All right. Uh, Mr. Tocalvis, Mr. Giordano's come in. Yeah. And, and that's where you grow, and that's where you start sure. to learn, you know, what? where is the spaghetti going to stick in life? Yeah. Football was it. I mean, I, I thank my dad for not allowing me to play till eighth grade. Um, but then it just blossomed from there. Baseball kind of went down a little bit, and I okay. started lifting weights. Ray Ayers was tough. He had a neck about this yes, thick. Yes, and yes. A voice that you could hear from a mile away. Almost had Jerry Faust type you know, yeah, rough, yeah. gruff stuff. But it was everything that young men were looking up to, you know, yeah. at an angle. He worked hard. He owned his own business. And then in spare time, he came out and coached football and baseball. I mean, you know, unfortunately for him, he recently, we all know, he recently passed away. Sure. So, you know, just a, what, what a great guy. But he's got a lot of tie-ins, not only for you, but he taught uh, or coached at Anderson for a little bit with Timmy mm -hmm. at uh, Anderson. So, so he's and he was at a couple other places too, wasn't he? I know that he's been so, but just Claremont, Glaneski, yeah, yeah, Anderson. Well, just what a great, yeah. great, great guy he was. Correct. And then he produced great leaders because Absolutely. of his ethic. Mm -hmm. I mean, so many young men looked up to him and they scoped their future, you know, not necessarily 100% Ray, but they saw what he donated and then that led to where they are. Sure. You know, you know the, the thing that I don't know if you guys have seen, I've seen it on Facebook. They're doing their first, uh, they're doing a memorial for Ray Ayers and the McNick uh, baseball team was one of the 85-86 baseball team I think was ones that donated to be one of the so that's really cool that you know that he's affected so many people in this community and that they're doing something for him. Absolutely and his yeah. son Nick's doing a great job his son Nick was coach at West Claremont now he's taking over at Williamsburg yeah. Yeah. so he's doing great things so yeah. promote his dad and awareness and, and keep that that's going right. absolutely and great the structure family. they have over there off of West Claremont and Sunny Lane that big establishment yes. I mean you can learn Camp sports Ayers. exactly yeah. I mean that's Camp a Ayers. nice facility it yeah. really is yeah it so, is I've been fortunate with good coaches yeah. I really have Bolger yeah. you know Mr. Bolger, Bolger my yeah. gosh you I know, forgot about him Mr. McCauley uh, George I saw him at the McNick High School Hall of Fame induction last yeah. week and he looks great I mean wow you, you talked about George and you talk about Bolger both of those guys coached under Jerry Faust at, at Moeller so they learned they sure. moved they right. share and then there was Coach Durger there too who also coached oh, at Moeller once legendary yeah I mean it, it, it's you're sharing with the next generation Generation, right, yeah. you know, exactly, and, and that's what these guys have done. Not just for me, but for you guys as well. For sure, I mean, your life is geared up by those guys. Oh, they absolutely. really are. Yeah, absolutely. So, what year did you graduate? From I graduated right? in eighty nine. Eighty nine. Eighty nine. That was the last year we beat Anderson, I believe. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I we'll believe get that a little yeah. bit later here. So, well, I don't mean to rub it in, but no. Come on. <laughs> I was just thinking you brought up eighty four, eighty five, and that was like the Pat Strickers and Pat Stricker, those, uh, those Tom guys. Furman, Mike Ramey, Mike, Mike Ramey, they were Kurt Keesling. They won state Timmy football, McLaughlin. correct? Yeah. Mark McDonald, Joe Schneider, Mark McDonald, yeah, uh, Stevie Bulger. But uh, so, but I was thinking across the board there, and you were just talking about it. They were really good in football. They were oh, they yeah. were they went to the state final four in basketball, yeah. and you're saying they were unbelievable in baseball yeah, and soccer as well. Really? That whole class was loaded. I, I think when you look back at you know why did McNick do well that year? Um, almost everybody that graduated from the private school, Mount St. Joe, uh, or excuse me, uh, Mount. The, Thomas More right, right here, sure. uh, Veronica, IHM, they all went to McNick. Right. I would say 99% of them. Okay. When I graduated from IHM, I would say 50% of the boys either went to St. X or to Anderson, and the other 50% went on to McNick. Why do you think that is? You know, it's a whole plethora of different things. You know, the east side, when my parents first moved here, uh, my dad's dad, grandpa, said, what are you, you going to do out there in Anderson? You know, cows walk backwards way out there. <laughs> what, what is is there to do I mean there's not much to do so you take in that High Park you know family that maybe possibly moved out to Anderson and some other things that added to that maybe a wife went to Ursula or Ursuline that married a McNick or an Anderson person and sure. then, you know maybe grandpa went to St. X or Purcell mm -hmm. and then they start to say hey this is what they have to offer you know my son is smart enough to go there and he's a good enough athlete that he can go there and yeah. you know you can move the next bar but McNick has so much stuff to offer too but it seemed like my my age, maybe a year or two before, and I know a lot after it really started well, that trend. It's funny you say that because Danny and I have been talking about that. About uh, at some point in time, we don't know yet, but we're trying to find out when. If you lived in a school district like Forest Hills, and you wanted to go private or to Catholic school, you had to go to that Catholic school that was in your district. Well, the difference between McNick and St. X is St. X is, is a Jesuit.
Hollywood school. Correct. McNick is Archdiocese. Correct. And that's also an all boys school. So they can get kids from Northern Kentucky, Lawrenceburg, Indiana. Sure. At the time to go to St. X. And that still is to this day. And when uh, when I was in eighth grade, there was a great athlete named Steve Bussey that was coming out of GA. And he went to Moeller. And that seemed to be the start of how can you go to Moeller and skip over McNick or go to St. X. Yeah, you're right down the road. And, I mean, what, what are we doing here? So yeah. it's no longer like that. I mean, you can go to GA from New Richmond. You can go to GA from uh, Milford. You can right. go to Veronica from yeah. Anderson as long as you're part of the well, Archdiocese. I mean, to your point, I just don't know if that has hurt schools like McNick. I think it's hurt a lot of people. I think that public schools are just as good as McNick, if not better, yeah. uh, in some aspects. And McNick beats other schools in other aspects as well. Sure. I mean, leaders leadership, church, values, you know, Mick yep. offers that that Anderson or Turpin doesn't offer. Right. Well, here's what Anderson does offer. They offer us a deluxe swimming pool. Right. They have a beautiful theater in there. Right. right. You know, right. McNick doesn't have that. Right. You know, they have a huge track that McNick just now built up in paradise. Well, right. we didn't have that when I was here. Right. So McNick is moving in the right direction they're to doing compete the right things. Right. with the St. X's. And yeah. they're doing terrific. What Drew Schmidt's doing oh, up there. Oh, he's doing a great job. And Coach Orlando. I mean, they're taking McNick to the next level but it takes a lot of things it takes winning it takes smarts academics teachers principal vision yeah it takes all that stuff mm -hmm. yeah. it, it really the does money is the key there yeah <laughs> it really does yeah. so you gotta go on to football there Danny no I thought you were going to talk about uh, state uh, there buddy boy well sure we can talk about state so we, we when you were at uh, at McNick and football or baseball how good were your teams now we hard? were absolutely loaded uh, when I left uh, I IHM, GA had an unbelievable class for two, three years, and so did IHM coming out of there. Kenny McManus came out of you know IHM, heck of a Kenny pitcher, McManus. which went on to pitch in Division One baseball. And then you had Mayer, you had TR, you had Minardi, all these guys coming out of GA. And then you had people outside of the 275 loop that were coming in there as well that all grew up with each other, playing on Knuckles, playing on Knuckles. the Wreckers, <laughs> uh, Wreckers, Ecker. I mean, Barry Martin played on that team, but it just seemed like we were all within a year and a half of each other, maybe two years, that class of 87, 88, and 89. I mean, it was just unbelievable. We had wow. a great run at everything. Football, baseball, boys basketball. We were doing really, really, really well. We really were. And you, you did you did make it to the finals? We state? did. We were state runners up my uh, junior year okay. uh, under Coach Ayers. Coach Ayers took us all the way there. Um, all those kids almost went off and played college baseball after that. Mayor went to Ohio University. O'Brien went to uh, Xavier University, mm -hmm. I believe. And then uh, my class, Stro Schneider went to Moorhead. Matt Ecker went to Wilmington. I mean, it, it was pretty loaded yeah. when it comes down to it. So Some good athletes. They really were. I mean, yeah. football, the same thing. You know, McNick was very, very powerful in football. They yeah. really were. Well, and just saying when you played with a, a legend in Ray Ayers, you also played with another one in George Markley. Talk a little bit about playing, uh, you know, that experience playing with uh, with Markley. George Markley was a the first real stern football coach that I had where he has the, the mindset of a gentleman and the mindset of a coach. And he displayed that 24-7. Um, it could be in school and he's in a suit. And you can be walking out to football practice and he's taking off the suit jacket and putting on the McNip football golf shirt. I mean, he was always the one to shake my mom's hand. I and mean, he would listen to my mom speak. You know, whether it was positive or negative, I don't know. That was between <laughs> her and coach. But he always had an ear for everybody and when you think of a coach or a legendary coach you think of those you know Newt Rockneys that are kneeling down listening to people talk mm -hmm. and their leadership not just communication wise but listening George had all that I mean he really yeah. did he showcased that very well so he taught there too he taught there too health, health. Mm -hmm. yeah. how long was he there oh geez idea? I want to say probably 12 to 15 years yeah. okay. that's, that's my guess hypothesis okay. mm -hmm. wow but they were loaded I mean they had a lot of great players Browning Brothers that I looked the, up to, Mark and uh, Mike. Massa. Gordy Massa. Kelly. I mean, Rod Bach. I mean, the list goes on and on and on. These guys that 
did so well at leadership and on the field and off the field. Yeah. That, I mean, it was unbelievable. Yeah. I mean, that first practice, you see uh, Rod Bachman over there, and he's yeah. about <laughs> six foot one, 240, and here I am coming out of eighth grade at 5'9", 201. <laughs> you know, what do you say to that? And then there's Brett Kelly at uh, Brett he's Kelly six, was mammoth, six, six three, four, yeah. or whatever he was, but Those are all, Those are all names you think of McNick in the 80s. Oh, yeah. Those are names you, th- you think of. Absolutely. Yeah, you Absolutely. Know? I made reserve my freshman year, and I got hit so hard by Brett Kelly. I told uh, Ray Ayers, I think I'm going to step down to the freshman <laughs> level. He said, I totally understand, Serger. I totally understand, but quit being a wimp. Somebody's going to hit you. And I was like, I think I'm just, that's where I need to be. I need to make new friends. I just got it. <laughs> that's funny. But, yeah, well, it is true. Well, let, let's talk true. about this thing right here, this helmet that here. is a heck of a helmet, isn't it? <laughs> you yeah, believe it's, that? It's, 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 let's, uh, and you got that, if I am right, from the, the Bengals, right? Yeah, so my freshman year, I played uh, all of five days, and <laughs> none of the helmets would fit this head, okay? Uh, wow. It's like a blow pop walking down the street <laughs> with legs on it. Uh, when when you're a little, when you're a young man, you know, when you're 5'10". You how big that is. That's huge. That is eight and three eighths. That's heavy, too. God, I know. Isn't that awesome? Unbelievable. So, I, I couldn't fit in any of the helmets, so my dad knew Cook Sporting Goods, and so he picked up the phone and, and contacted Cook Sporting Goods, and Cook Sporting Goods got a hold of the bangles, and then my dad ran down there on behalf of McNick's checkbook, uh, wrote them a check <laughs> for whatever that was. I, uh, I think that, I, I would say it's probably every bit of two thirty, maybe $300 back in the yeah. day. Uh, that's a top-of-the-line so, helmet. So what year was this, you think? That was uh, 85. <laughs> was that 86? 86. Summer of 86. So that could have been Anthony Mino's helmet? <laughs> I think Anthony's actually was smaller than mine. <laughs> <laughs> that was a brand new helmet okay. when my dad picked wow. it up. All right, that's, that's crazy. So all the upperclassmen, boulder head, fat head, <laughs> and, and they all knew who I was before I was going in there. And some, yeah. of the, some of the guys didn't. And, you know, you jump on the bandwagon. And, and all kidding aside, because it's all in good humor, people would consider that bullying today. And, and it isn't bullying. Yeah, was I embarrassed maybe the first two times? Yeah. Sure, because I'm the one standing on the sidelines <laughs> without a helmet on. I mean, that's, that's kind of embarrassing. Yeah. And, uh, well, sure enough, they got the helmet, and, and the rest takes care of itself. But I remember sitting there at lunchtime, <laughs> and they would say, "Hey, Boulderhead, what are you having for lunch?" And I'd go, I'd just, you know, you laugh, you shake your head. But you know, on the field, all they all treat you like a teammate. Absolutely. They were all friends. I mean, sure. nobody gave me too right. much gruff. Right. They knew I couldn't handle. Right. You know, and I got punched a little bit in the arm. Oh, sir, you know, tough it up. You know right. how it is. Right. And it's all good fun. Yep. Okay. Right. Yep. They didn't take it to the next level. I wasn't thrown out of a window or right, wimp right, right. or see if my head would fit through the school bus. Window. Well, and that was more acceptable back then. It was. It was. It was a good, clean form of hazing. And that was okay. That's how I would right. say that. Yeah. Right. And, uh, and you make friends that way. I right. mean, I, you hate to say it. Everybody has a nickname. Dingo. Sure. You know, <laughs> yeah. I mean, cowboy boots back in the day. Why do you yes, come up sir. with that one? You know, <laughs> well, coach is piece of cake. Yeah, that, one, that one's <laughs> that, easy. That's a piece of cake. Yeah, but, that, you one's know, easy. that one's easy. When you're wearing those cowboy boots that O.J. Simpson wore back in the magazines <laughs> back in the you. day. <laughs> That's what you're called, his dingo. You, you know? could have seen him walk in the halls in these uh, cowboy boots. Hey, but but I, I made sure that I always wore them on Friday nights with my jeans on and my yeah. football jersey on. You know, I made sure I had my cowboy boots right, on Friday night. Right, right, night. right, right. Yes, you would have thought he was in a movie Footloose or something. <laughs> you're right. <laughs> I'll be I darned. Could've. I could have. <laughs> I yes. can see your dad. Yes, I can, I can I see him now. I can, I can no. do that. No. Uh, so let, let's talk about the, uh, we were going to talk about this, but you said you were senior year, you beat uh, the old Andrew. And a wrap will go to our commercial brought to you by Dingo's and OJ Simpson. Uh, no, go ahead. So our senior year, we, we had not won a game at all. And uh, I believe Anderson was 8-1. and one, So they had to beat us in order to go on to the playoffs, I believe. Yeah. Okay. Well, we had nothing on the line. And, and every game leading up to that, Coach George would, Markley would get up and say, who are you going to beat? And we would say the opposing team. Well, that game, it was pouring down rain. The bus yep. just pulled in. And he stood up, beat Anderson, beat Anderson, beat Anderson. 
and and we all looked at each other and, and we got off the bus and it was pouring down i mean rain beyond it was actually raining sideways really you couldn't see anything on the field and it was it was, was grass, grass then. i it mean was grass. it was, well, it was pretty thick mud at that as point. mud yeah. could be i yeah. mean I, yeah. I don't know how else maybe a swamp uh, yeah, yeah. you know maybe there was an alligator in the back i don't know what crawled up the hill that day but <laughs> yeah uh, but the score was eight to six that right? is correct eight eight that is six. correct it, it was unbelievable i mean the best play that we had ran a million times in up there on mcnick in paradise we ran it a million times it's, i direct snapped it to jeff bolger who was our place kicker okay for the field goal jerry robinson our quarterback was the holder so i direct snapped it straight to jeff craig will hoyt went out a little bit on a button hook to the right and jeff plopped it right over there and boom wow. eight to six and that was it. I mean, I, I, they didn't I, couldn't, see it I couldn't snap anything for the rest of the game. Chris <laughs> Berger couldn't run. Yeah. Coach Siriano couldn't call a play. I mean, it was beyond was it. a mess. Yeah. yeah. I, I can't you even couldn't imagine. see anybody. Anderson with their nice, clean, white pants. Ours Not with white anymore. Whoops. You couldn't see. Couldn't see Anything. the numbers. That would have been a nightmare for guys calling the game when he can't see numbers. You but know? it yeah. was terrific from McNick's end. I mean, we were on the bus. The bus was rocking. Uh, right, we got to cut it off. I now. mean, it, it was <laughs> awesome. So to go out that way, I mean, it was really unbelievable. My mom was a little upset, but, uh, yeah, you know, she's a right. redskin. She, yeah. But, you know, her son's McNick. So she sat in the middle. Whichever team won, she was happy with it. That's what right. she said. Oh, yeah. I always loved the Redskins with yeah. me. Right? Yeah, that's yeah. right. I mean, that's so, a great memory. Coach, uh, uh, wore that same helmet for me for four years and then when I graduated the athletic director Dave Becker was his name said yeah. congratulations Jimmy there's no way in heck that anybody's going to come through McNick with a fatter oh head than you why don't you go ahead and keep the helmet so here, you on go, the yeah, here you go <laughs> so I kept that so now it's 35 almost 34 years old some uh, people got a letter for their jacket he got a, he got he a got helmet, helmet. <laughs> exactly and it looks exactly the same that's it, it. That's I think amazing. the face mask alone could just fit 95% oh, of the helmets out there I love I love those face masks so with football or baseball was there any thoughts of going on to play in college there was I was going to go to Georgetown the Tigers or Wilmington and uh, I got the tapes from Coach George and we sent them down there and they called me back and they said we'd love to you know extend to try out or go down there and visit so we went down there and visit and he said okay we would love for you to play football here okay and i just sat there and my mom was on my left and my dad was on the right and he said uh well what do you think and i was like well i think i'm gonna have to pass but thanks for having me down here today really wow. and my parents did not say a word to me in the car ride home from georgetown i, I don't even think we pulled over once uh, yeah they didn't even have the radio on i mean they were starstruck and i had just pick up the phone and call Wilmington's head coach too and said I'm going to have to pass so I didn't play I mean I was first team all league in there and I think honorable mention all city but the big thing that I loved about McNick and, and that was lifting weights I mean I was right there in the prime when really lifting heavy shoulders and bench pressing and squatting was really hitting the high right. schools I mean right. my dad wrote a check to buy a new squat rack I mean five years before that nobody really was investing in school equipment yeah sure. the mowers were and the X's were and maybe the elders were and, and Anderson probably right, right. as well but McNick wasn't up right. there yet yeah we had a bench and we had a multi rack with you know right. 15 Universal. different exercises right, you right, can right. do yeah. you know we had that but you know my freshman year with Ray Ayers and there was a great mentor Randy Mink I don't know if you guys sure. are familiar yeah. oh, he's with him. a big strong guy and I wanted to be Randy Mink so bad and Mike and Mark Browning and Gordy Mass and Chris Hoffmeyer. Chris Hoffmeyer. Wow, that's yeah. some that's a crew right there. Those guys I would see at the YMCA and then working out at McNick and then I would, you know, run track or whatever in the summertime and I would see Chris and those yeah. guys working out and, and I just fell in love with lifting weights. Okay. I loved lifting weights. And uh, that's the reason why I threw my arm out my senior or junior year in baseball was lifting, lifting weights. weights. I, I, I was sold. I wanted to be Brian Bosworth. <laughs> I wanted to be that guy. That was you it. Know, Arnold Schwarzenegger, heck yeah, I'm yeah. going to work out twice as hard as anybody else. Yeah. I was taking the vitamins that GNC was selling. I mean, yeah. I think today they're considered steroids probably <laughs> 35 years later. But, uh, I mean, it was all in. I mean, Randy Mink was an excellent mentor. Yeah. I met him my probably my sophomore year with the Brownings and all those guys and 
you know, just looking up to him and educating me on nutrition right. and how to work out properly. And as a matter of fact, he still runs a gym out there in Amelia Forza out there by Poochie's right, oh, almost right across Poochie, the street. Poochie's I mean, it, place. it is an unbelievable gym. So okay. they, it's a rough, tough guy's yeah. gym. And then yeah. right behind that, they have uh, nine rounds of equipment for cardio. I mean, you have the best of both worlds. Wow. So, all right. So you had an opportunity, but you chose to decline. Yeah. All right. But you know, better things on the horizon. Let's let's walk through and give us your career path from that moment driving home from you know with your parents and what your career path is taking. Because uh, <laughs> this, well, this, this is amazing. Got, this I amazing. think when we got home, uh, you know, my mom and dad just you know needed a couple days to iron iron things through for what I was thinking or what they were thinking. And okay. you know, everybody gets accepted to the University of Cincinnati. You know, and I was like. I'm going to UC. I'm going to study general education. I don't know what I'm going to do. I'm going to rush a fraternity house and I'm going to stay working at the little convenience store down yeah. there on 8 Mile and I'm going to throw spaghetti at the wall all day long and try to figure out what I want to do. Okay. And so I rushed a fraternity house and then I was working out in the UC, old UC gym. This thing was so rusted out. It cost $10 a month. And I loved it. And all I did was work out in there, go to school, w work out at the fraternity house a little bit, go to parties there, and then work. And I was like, there's got to be more than this than, yeah. than what I'm doing. And the Gulf War broke out. Okay. And I remember driving over the Big Mac Bridge. And as I had told my fraternity brother, I think I'm going to join the Marines tomorrow. And he looked at me and said, oh, come on, you're going to join the Marines? No way. And I was like, ah, you're probably right. I'm not tough enough. And uh, so about three months went by and then four months, six months, you know, the Gulf War started to settle down again and I was getting ready to get my two year degree. So I was like, you know, I'm going to go see a Navy recruiter. I went out to the Navy recruiter out there in Eastgate. Mm -hmm. Didn't tell my parents anything because I knew I was going to get my diploma by December. And I said, uh, how do I sign up? He said, just sign right there and you're signed up. I said, okay, wow. let me sign up. So they took me down to take a test, the ASVAB test over in Northern Kentucky. And the guy said, here's the three jobs that I think that you're going to be best at. Okay. One is a Navy diver. And then he looked at me and said, scratch that. We probably can't get a diving <laughs> helmet for your head. So scratch it. All right. All right. He said, the next one, how about a chaplain, Navy chaplain? He said, no, no, you're too Catholic for me for that one. This is in the middle. He said, how about an operations specialist? You said, you'll have a top secret clearance. You'll work in the hub of an aircraft carrier and you will all communications on aircraft, submarines, helicopters will go through there. And then you'll go through a nine month school down in Virginia Beach. I said, sign me up. Sounds pretty good. So I signed up and I came home and told my parents and I think my mom fainted on the, in the Claremont side of the house. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> that way nobody could see her through the woods. Uh, yeah. and, uh, but they were 100% supportive. Uh, my parents couldn't have been happier for me. Okay. So uh, I took off and I went to boot camp then to Virginia Beach and then down there I was number four and number five in my class and they had a big huge chalkboard with every station in the world and it said North Norfolk, Norfolk, Washington, Florida, Hawaii. Mm -hmm. Then it went to Japan. I said, I'll take Japan. And the guy said, why would you take Japan for? I said, there's no way anybody's ever going to pay for me to live in Tokyo, Japan, except for the next four years. The government will pay for everything for me to live there. Right. I'll take that. I can always go to Norfolk. I can always go to right. Bremerton, Washington. Right. I can always go to San Diego. Wow. But I'll never get a chance to live in Tokyo for four right. years. I said, I'm at out of here so came back for leave before i took off for 30 days and then i never came home for two and a half years uh every vacation i had i cashed it in and then i would backpack all through asia so i backpacked through malaysia singapore indonesia thailand multiple times wow and well, that's an experience right there it really is i mean yeah when people laugh at the military you know i don't know if you'd be tough enough you don't have to be that tough it's on the back end that you don't realize what they have to offer until you get in there and then everybody's like try this do this they have this i mean there's so many opportunities right. once you go in okay i mean we had open boxing matches we go in there and box each other oh, wow be like, okay steve i'm gonna take you for the boxing match yeah. and put your names up and there'd be thousands of people in this gym thousands what? 
<laughs> all watching everybody box. <laughs> and you're crazy. all friends. Sure. Yeah. You didn't even have to sign a waiver. If you got beat up, you know, there was somebody right there on a stretcher and take you right off and you go. <laughs> <laughs> nobody ever got killed. Brush it off, yeah. you're good. That's funny. Yeah, nobody ever got killed. But, yeah. you know, there's a lot of good things that the military had to offer. Structure, yeah. unity, fraternity-type life. I mean, the benefits are unbelievable. So anybody out there listening, where you just go down and see your recruiter. Yeah, half of the stuff is kind of made up because they're trying to sell something to you. The back half is the truth. Yeah. So I really applaud anybody thinking about going in there. Well, I agree with you. And I don't want to discount your service because that's awesome that you... Absolutely. You dedicated and, and being away from your family and everything like that, but but the time you spent there and your off time, as you're saying, I mean. Am I correct that you you climbed Mount Fuji? That is correct. So uh, they had. A, hey, what are you doing? What are you doing tonight? Hey, want to go climb Mount Fuji? Yeah, sure. Danny that's, walked to convenience. Yeah, that's, that's, right, that's, that's right. That's right. 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 Well, so, so tell us about that. So they have a great thing in the military called morale, welfare, and recreation. So they do that one to build morale. Okay. And then welfare to make you better. Sure. And recreation, they think of things outside of the norm to get the young men or women pumped up to be over there. So they okay. they have all these sign up sheets on cork boards all over over the place so a buddy of mine put our names up there and the bus came and picked us up I think at 3 a.m. we got to the base of Mount Fuji which is the largest base of a mountain in the world it goes on for about two miles till it really starts to go up so for two miles it's about a quarter of an inch to an inch incline so the driver said we're gonna skip the first two miles because that will take you guys about another three hours so oh, we're gonna wow. get right to the point okay so we started climbing at one inch at the base yeah but it was one inch right. Way back, way gradually back. going up. He's like, nobody cares about that. So right. he's like, you're not going into the record books. Any of you aren't, so don't worry about that. I said, yes, sir. Sounds good to me. Yeah. <laughs> so he says, okay, <laughs> six o'clock. They gave us a stick and he said, start climbing. So you go right up, you keep going, you keep going, you keep going. And every thousand feet, you get the stick burned of how many feet you're on. And there's Japanese people trying to sell you bottles of oxygen. And I'm just zipping by me and my little buddy. Woo, woo, woo. Gosh. And there are people up there in their 80s, Japanese. Oh, yeah, climbing it. Wow. So we got all the way up to the top, and the tour guide was smart enough. He says, listen, when you come down, go left. Left is right. Go left. Do not go right. Go left. So we got to the fork, and sure enough, we listened to that little kitty cat. You know, yeah. from, <laughs> He was right there. He said, go yeah. left. And we made it to the bottom, and we sat there on the bus. And it was probably, gosh, 9 o'clock at night by now. So it had already been about 15 hours. And we were waiting on another couple, husband and wife. And he said, hey, Anybody seen this couple? Uh oh. Well, I turned in another hour. He's like, we got to go. Well, they went right. Oh, no. So they went oh, behind wow. Mount Fuji, and then we ran into them maybe a couple weeks later, and he said, yeah, there really are vampires <laughs> that live behind oh, Mount Fuji. This is why I guess that's an old folklore that oh, vampires are there. But uh, wow. it, what a terrific experience. It really is. Absolutely. I mean, just I mean, think about what you could have been doing if you would have yeah. you know, just stayed and finished your you know college, which you could always still do that. Sure. But the experiences, you can't replace that. You, you can't. And that's why I tell everybody, live life right now like you're going to go in a couple years. You know? know, And don't come up with any excuses. Like, I'm going to do it tomorrow, or I'm going to do it in a month from now, or I'll start six weeks from now. Yeah. Just just go for it. Yeah. Start doing it now. Wow. Because yeah. you'll thank yourself in a year when well, you're done with well, it. Wow. And I'm going to tell you something. You know, you and I have talked before, and some of that stuff you said, and it, and it you know, it kind of hit me a couple times with certain things going on. It's like, I started to do that, like, uh eh. I'm not going to do that because of this or that. And then I ended up like... You know, that's silly. Just do it. I mean, you, you know what I mean? So yeah. for you, I mean, that was good, good advice. And I think I, it, it kind of hit me like, you know, w the things that you did. I mean, just think yeah. about that. That experience that you've had, that you've done that is just incredible. You know? And it was fun. And it was a venture. You know, yeah. Like they say, you get to see the world literally sure. in the Navy. You yeah. get to see the world. Absolutely. I mean, yeah. anything you want to see. You know, yeah, that's well, some of those to... traits obviously were passed on from your parents. Sure. And your, Absolutely. Your dad. Absolutely. You know, saying so, you mentioned your dad uh, played, or he had a chance to play professional basketball or baseball. He got drafted, correct. And correct. so, talk a little bit about your dad, and then your your family yourself. Well, it's funny as you, you hear funny stories about your parents, and you never really man, did he really, or <laughs> did she really? Right. So we had always heard uh, through dad, and he was never one to stand up on top of Mount Fuji and rant and rave about his successes. You know, um, he was very humble, and he only shared it when he needed to. Share 
share it. So yeah. dad played, you know, baseball here at, at McNick. And then uh, he was actually drafted by the Phillies. They came to the door in 67. Really? And they knocked on the door and presented him with a letter. And his grandfather, his dad, my grandpa said, if you accept that, you will have to go to Vietnam. Because dad also had his draft letter. And in the same hand, he also had a full ride to Indiana State. And he also had a full ride to UC for baseball. Okay. So it was up to him to pick one of the three. So if he goes to the Phillies, he's got to go to Vietnam because you were not you deferred because you didn't have college. Right. And no one's going to pick, yes, I'd like to go to Vietnam right. with a draft number. Correct. If you're choosing to go, you go down and you make your own placement. I'll, I'll be this and that and right. they'll listen to you. Right. So he chose UC and he ended up playing four years with Glenn Sample down there sure. and they wow. he hit a lot of home runs for him and he put him in the... Uh, last regional and they beat Wichita he did a walk off home run and it was unbelievable and then he had really hurt himself bad with ankle playing semi pro ball over Hobner Field okay he broke his ankle at UC you know that was fine then he hurt his ankle again yeah. but, but the funny part about all this stuff is Larry Bird played third base at Indiana State when my dad would have been offered to go to Indiana State you're kidding me so that's the funny part the other funny part is is Mike Schmidt and my dad are one year apart and Mike Schmidt played third base and yeah. my dad played third base. Yeah. So I'm like, either way you would have had Bird or Schmidt or OU <laughs> and so wow. he, he chose UC and uh, and he did great. You know, I took him to a couple games this year and he loves it. He okay. really does love it. He actually got to throw out an opening pitch. I got him signed up for that. He got to go on the mound at UC and oh, throw out an opening that's great. pitch. I mean, it was really neat to that's see him awesome. cherish that's the cool. moments. And then uh, my mom went to Anderson so she is officially a Redskin. Yes. Yes. She was a cheerleader. She was actually a cheerleader for Dr. Bell, Dr. Howard yes. Bell. Yeah. Yes. They were the same graduating yes. class. So okay. he was the all-star quarterback, I believe. And she was the cheerleader. And then she was also in the uh, GAA, Girls Athletic Association. Yep. So she claims she played rugby. She claims she played volleyball. She claims she played ice hockey. She claims <laughs> that she, <laughs> she wow. threw the javelin because there's no records. If you were part of the GAA, it didn't right. say specifically what sport you played. Okay. The only sport was cheerleading, I believe, yeah. if you look through the yearbooks. Yeah. So mom would always say, yeah, when I was playing rugby or field hockey or when we were playing hockey. So yeah. mom mom would amplify it a little right. bit because she knew there was no way anybody could go back to but verify it. You got some good genes there. Yeah, you yeah, do. yeah, yeah. Well, I was fortunate and so was my brother. You know, he went on and played football at St. X. So. Okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And anybody else? Family? That's it. Just the two of us. Okay. Uh, that was enough. I think my parents they, they believed in it so two's enough they did their part God yeah. was happy that they reproduced so you know two's enough two's enough you know two's enough oh. but, but mom was a big person in Anderson she really was and she continued to do that for many years with Anderson uh, Mr. Grooms and her uh, Roger, Roger Grooms, Grooms he would contact her she was big in the theater department okay. and she would help go back and help what she could contribute to theater whatever she could do she was in multiple plays and, yeah and Anderson in high school. I'm actually, I think about eight plays she was in and Anderson. So wow. Mr. Grooms and her were really I good friends. I love Roger Grooms. Legend. Roger Grooms. Yeah, yeah, everybody him. knows Roger Grooms. He's a legend. I know. Even if you're five, you yeah. know who Roger well, Grooms is. So well-rounded. He was a teacher, but he was a drama. Umpire. But, but he was umpire. also an umpire referee. I, mean, I didn't know that. Yeah. How crazy is that? You yeah. know what? He, he showed us. I had him in speech class and he showed us like we would tell him, hey, we want to see that video when there must have been an umpire Umpire strike. Yeah, he was, and he was umpired, and he called Joe Morgan out at first base, and Morgan got so mad he slammed his helmet down and got up in Roger Grooms' face, and he shows us that video yeah. all the time. Did Roger say acting? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> 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 yeah, that is true. Yeah, um, it is. Funny. So, so well, let, let's get into I, you know one of the things that uh, that I really love that you did is you've wrote you've written a couple books, uh, and some of them happen to do uh, deal with a lot of things that I'm familiar with is that Summit Meets and uh, Bob, um, um, oh God, I'm drawing his Capel, Capel, and then uh, Dan Horchmeyer too were at Summit Meets that we visited all the time, Correct. and then also Correct. Convenient Food Mart. Sure, sure. So, so talk a little bit about those uh, the books and then. The, the experience that you've had with it. And so the first book I wrote was with my dad called Go the Distance, which we all know is from Field to Dreams. Um, yeah, yeah. This book is about how far are you willing to go for unconditional love? Well, the answer is forever. Mm -hmm. You know, if you truly have unconditional 
unconditional love that it'll just take off. I mean, right. there won't be a hesitation. There won't be a stoplight. And my dad and I had a couple stoplights through his and I's wrongdoings, and it was time for him and I to mend it. So with dad missing the College Baseball World Series by a game for Father's Day, gosh, this is probably about 14 years ago, I said, why don't you and I drive out to Omaha, just you and I, and we'll catch a double header, and then we'll turn around and drive right back. He said, done deal. So he and I got in the car and we drove. Not a single tune was playing. We had apples and grapes, bologna sandwiches, Diet Coke, and I think a, a whole gallon of coffee. Yeah. And all we did was talk and talk and talk and talk. And we went out there and we watched a double header. Yep. And then we turned around and drove back. And then the following year for Father's Day, I took him to the Phillies game. Uh, it was the Phillies versus the Reds. And then from there, we went to Pittsburgh. And then things just started happening with my dad and I. Every Father's Day, we started doing something. And then the time came that after I started reading a lot of books, I was like, why don't you and I write a book together and name it Go the Distance? We love Field of Dreams. Most guys love Field of Dreams. Sure. Something in that movie triggers Happy their brain yeah. about a father and a son connection. Yep. Um, what have you. And so we did it. And we wrote it. And it took him and I probably about five and a half months to write it. And we went back and forth, bumped ideas, put it on paper. And then the first publisher I solicited to picked it right up. They gave me an A+. Plus for writing and they, uh, I was like what? what what's going on and, and I said I can't believe it my mom I think fainted again in, in Claremont for the third time yeah. or fourth time probably with those funny stories so we did it and it ended up doing very well and so with That's that great. I, uh, I appreciate that and, and he and I really had a lot of fun yeah I brought up some hard stuff but you know to be a real man you gotta admit you were wrong and I was wrong on things when I was young yeah. and uh, most fathers and sons do have a duel once right, in a while sure. even yep. when you're young or mid-aged or a little bit older correct so my dad and i did that and now for the last 15 16 17 years he and i are best friends like we always had been wonderful uh, it's almost like back in the 50s and the 60s you right. go up back you beat each other up but guess what an hour and a half later you're best right. friends best again friends. you want to come over you want to come over you wanna, let's, awesome. let's, right, let's right. go do it and no, that's, that's what awesome. our relationship was you know wow. we didn't bad mouth anybody through social media or anything like that yeah but, yeah you know, i mean that that led to your other books so you've written what three totals that so i've written four books four to, my four. fifth book comes out in about 20 days and then i'm working on my sixth book right now so that's incredible jimmy that's well, awesome. i think Good it's a lot you. of fun it, it keeps you going i mean everybody yep. has stories to share you yep. have stories to share yep. and you have stories to share and guess what there is a crowd and an audience mm -hmm. that want to hear your stories right and all you got to do is put it on paper and you have to start right and i tell everybody out there start it's like this podcast you talk about it you kick the idea around now it's thanksgiving let's do it steve well, i don't right. know danny it's christmas all right what about now well now it's easter you know what am i going to do now well the kids have well you find excuses and I, I just couldn't do it. So when I was operations manager at the Indianapolis airport, I actually set my alarm for 1 a.m. And I would write from 1 a.m. until 3.30, then make eggs and head to the airport because I had to be at the airport at 5. So you had to find a window right. sure. while you're working full time because that would be awful if I told my wife, hey, I got fired because I was writing the book at the airport. But hey, look, I got a book. <laughs> I don't think that would go over very well. Yeah. So when you want something bad enough, just like you two gentlemen have right here what an excellent show you have you, you just awesome, start man. it you just do it yeah. Yeah. you know and you find a way to do it if you really want to make something yeah. happen you do it well you're really good at it obviously and you must love it I love it I, I think it's a great outlet for me yeah um, my brain runs 24-7 I, I thought three more thoughts just in the 15 minute drive from my house over here uh, terrific stories I mean, I write it down I mean, right, you never right. know what's going to happen it's exactly you, right you truly don't know yeah. Until you give it a shot. Yeah. yeah. Man, that's awesome. Well, they're, they're good books. Well, you had talked about your trip with your dad. That's an incredible honor. I mean, you know, Danny and I feel special about that as well. But you recently created a scholarship at Anderson High School in honor of your mom. I did. So it's uh, through Anderson uh, Boosters, Tom Tuciano, I believe That's I pronounced it. his last name correct. Yep. So he and I went back and forth um, in late February, and I came up with this idea that will honor my mom since she was an athlete mm -hmm. and she was in theater, yep. and she believes that you need both to succeed, uh, whether that be the debate team and 
and sports right. or theater and sports. Mm -hmm. She believes everybody should be good communicators. And she thinks theater really brings out the best in people, gives them confidence. It gives them a scene on the, you know, of course, on the actual main stage. Sure. Plus, it's a great reference, and it's a great talker that she always thought 20 years later. Yeah. Because for her to say, I was in Bye Bye Birdie, well... What? You were in Bye Bye Birdie? People would pause. Yeah. You're Marilyn Serger. You're the, you're the one that started the McNick Rocket Shop selling the first clothing at lunchtime at McNick. <laughs> and you were in Bye Bye Birdie? And people yeah. would be amazed. You know, this little thing, yeah. you know, five foot one, maybe right. a, a dollar <laughs> five or maybe even right at a dollar. Yeah. Uh, so I contacted Tom and it's going to be a thousand. It's going to be for a young lady that will graduate. A thousand dollars cover books like Tom said or, you know, whatever online courses or however they want to use it, but right. they have to be for a senior. That's awesome. So um, it's terrific for That's mom. Great. Sure. Passed, That's you know. incredible. Yeah, she passed away yeah. with ALS last year, and it's a good way to remember her. She loved Anderson. She loved everything about Anderson. Yeah. Her and dad would fight sometimes. <laughs> Little verbal squimishes. Jimmy yeah. should go to Anderson. No, he's got to go to Big Nick. No, Jimmy should go to Anderson. Mr. Grooms is there. They got yeah. trapped. They got <laughs> this. And, you know, they would bun heads on that. Yeah. You know, like husband and wife do. Yeah, sure. Two absolutely. Good, good thoughts. And, yeah. Uh, That's so awesome. we did what an honor. It, and we're waiting for Tom and the athletic director yeah. should put that out here soon. That's awesome. Uh, it'll be a thousand. So it's a nice ride up to her. It's a nice tribute to her. And absolutely. at the same time, uh, we bought her a plate at, I believe it's the Roger Grooms Theater. Isn't that correct? Yeah. Where they yeah. were the fundraisers. Yeah. So we bought a plate uh, for mom through that in her honor. Uh, help raise money. Very cool. That. I mean, she was very passionate about it. She really really was. Yeah. Uh, I did one play at McNick. I was a little boy in a Christmas carol that ran and got to Turkey and uh, she said, you'll thank yourself for doing it in 20 years. <laughs> and sure enough, I was that little boy that went and got to Turkey on the Christmas carol. It wasn't a big part, but I tell you what, it looks good. It, it, it really does. And you, For young men and young women uh, in high school right now, and they're thinking about how do I get a step ahead of my yeah. peers or something like that, just do one or two classes. Right. You don't have to be the best. You don't have to have the lead. Yep. No one's saying that. Just a small little part, and you put that ray underneath there. That's a resume enhancer. Absolutely. Right? It's just one little thing. Agreed. Right. Absolutely. You're separating yourself. I mean, yeah. we always look for I a agree. reason to separate everybody. Couldn't agree more. Absolutely. Yeah. No, that, that, that's awesome. I'm glad you did that for your mom. I'm glad you still got that relationship with your dad. So we're gonna go ahead and try to do, wrap this up. But let's let's do the one thing that we always do at the end is mm -hmm. we always do a favorite uh, high school memory, a favorite college memory and then maybe you know maybe favorite teacher coach anything like that so what's your favorite uh, high school memory and don't say beating to I, Anderson I hate to say this don't say beating Anderson but uh, it was beating Anderson oh. <laughs> I mean, that was a unbelievable oh. experience I mean Probably it really was it not be that's, I mean, that's it really be. was I mean all my friends that I grew up with in Summit played on Anderson yeah. because you know Turpin back then was divided by Clough and Summit right. was on the south side of Clough yeah. so they all went there I mean I knew everybody on yeah, the team yeah. you know that was funny Matt, Matt Matter of fact, my mom's best friend was Jay Sullivan's Jay, mom. Yeah, Jay Sullivan, yeah. Yeah. And I remember my junior year, she said, please don't hurt Jay. Please, <laughs> please don't hurt Jay. You and Mr. Braun, please yeah, do not hurt that's Jay. That's funny. And, and that's how tight in some it was. We yeah. were all tight in. So that was really the fond memory of Big Nick was beating Anderson we're gonna from let, the athletic side. We're going to let that one pass. That's right. Um, <laughs> so let, let, what about college? you have a favorite college memory? Uh, there are so many good college memories. The one I always share the most is the difference between UC today and UC yesterday. Uh, yeah. My freshman year, my fraternity took us all to the Miami Hurricanes versus the Bearcats game. Oh, yeah. And really? it, it was 56 to nothing, the Hurricanes at halftime. And I believe there was 4,000 people in the stadium. Yeah. Uh, the Coke vendor still had the same case of Coke in his hand that he started the game <laughs> out bet. with. Uh, there was nobody there. Yeah. Nobody. Yeah. And then today you go back and it's jam-packed. Yeah. Oh, you yeah. guys got season yes. tickets. Yeah. You're going it's, to the game. Incredible! It's, I mean, yeah. it awesome. is unbelievable. Yeah. So I always tell everybody, remember that good memory yeah. today, <laughs> where we were yesterday, and what builds on that because everybody can have a vision. You know, Fickle's doing an awesome job oh, down man. there. But you also got to thank all the other guys too. You know, Mark D'Antonio, yeah. build it up. To Rick now. Mentor, right? Rick yeah. Mentor. You got to thank Rick he's, Mentor. He's the one that really got yeah, it going. Started. Absolutely. You know. And then the, the AD Taylor was the one that kind of started. Who's was the guy at Yale? 
<laughs> oh, that's uh, Godfrey, didn't it? No, no. Uh, the guy's he's still at Yale, I think. Yeah, he is. I th- he was Godfrey, before right. Mentor. You're right. Uh, Mur- Mur- Murphy. Uh, yeah. Something Murphy. Yeah, Tim Murphy. Tim, Tim Murphy. Murphy. That's Tim it. Tim Murphy. Murphy. Yeah. yeah. That's it. That's and then it. What, about, what about what your favorite, favorite coach, favorite teacher? I'd say Ray Ayers by yeah. far. I, I really would. But, you know, the one thing that I always remember is the older guys. Mm-hmm. And I really do remember those. I hate to say it again. It's like a broken record. The Mass and the Brownings, uh, you know, and Randy Mink. He didn't go to McNick with me, but he was older. You, you just don't realize how much leadership qualities you have when you become a senior. Right. How many other people are looking yeah. up to you. You just don't know it because you don't have to have a title to be a leader. Everybody's yeah. being watched all the time. How do you handle your character inside and out, on the field, off the field, in the classroom, out of the classroom what have you but when you think of that uh, that's what i really cherish about yeah. me because i always looked up to the older they might only have been one year older like andy mayer why well, i looked right. up to him mm-hmm. one year older than that well joe schneider you know one right. year older than that mike ramey kirk keesling i mean you sure. think of those guys and that's the memory that i have yeah. in mcnick and they're instilling that to young men and young women today both anderson's do it both mcnick's doing it yeah everybody andrew norwell's a leader on yeah. sean brennan now yeah, yeah fresh right. Yeah, uh, right. Varsity coach his first year. People are already looking yeah. up to him yeah. already. But that was a choice you made. You would surround yourself with good people like that. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, it yeah. really is. That's what counts. Yeah, I, t- I tell you what, Jimmy, this is uh, awesome to obviously catch up with you and watch all the things that you have going on with the books and this stuff. And I I'll just bring this up real quick on the books is I, I I was going nuts one time when I when I was on uh, watching Fox News and uh, saw the thing and it was your book. Yeah. And, uh, and I was like, oh, my God. And I was like, I know, I know. And she's like, you know. And I said, yeah, he lived in some of the states. And I tried to explain to my wife that that's who we, you, you know, we're doing on this podcast. So that's that's awesome, man, that, that all this has taken off. I'm so happy for you. Yep. I'm glad that the relationship's still with your dad. And if I can do anything, I'm sure both of us would love to have that uh, one more time to have that, you Absolutely. know, I that, that drink and that, yep. you know, hanging sure. out at the, at the sure. Hall of Fame. So I'm glad that you get to experience that. It's, it's uh, been great catching up with you. Well, I appreciate both of you gentlemen. It was a great show. It really yep. is. I look forward to your next one. <laughs> I appreciate well, that, That's going to be the good one. That, that'll right, be a right, good right. one. So. Thank well, you, Steve I, and Danny. I really appreciate it. I appreciate Coach it. Coach and Dingo. So, Coach and Dingo will be coming up uh, this Friday. We're going to release our first show on Friday, so yep. we'll, uh, we'll see how that goes. You know, we're sick awesome. of us. <laughs> see, yeah. go awesome. So, yeah, we're, we're, we're looking forward to it. So we're fun. Yeah, we're, we're going to go ahead and wrap it up here. So, for uh, Steve Ellis, Dan Average, and Jimmy Serger, you've been listening to uh, This Week in Anderson. We'll catch you next week. We'll be right back.